Hi, and thank you for watching the ninth video in the series of God's Roadmap to the End. I've received many comments and requests with regards to the contentious subject known as the Rapture, and whether this is an actual event, or whether this is a false doctrine, and if this is true, when exactly will it occur? As we have now covered some of the important aspects of Daniel's 70th week, I thought it would be good to start a new series in which we will be addressing the rapture from a biblical perspective. This is such a rich subject and there is so much information hidden in the Word of God about this and I'm really excited to share this with you. There are various aspects to cover and I will once again have to spread this over a number of installments to ensure I cover all the bases and perspectives that have to be considered. I will also approach this from a vantage point that will hopefully reveal new insight. Once again, I'm only offering you my opinion and what I understand, and I have no desire to judge or argue with any person holding to a different viewpoint. In fact, the Bible clearly points out that there will be different viewpoints on the subject, and I will also look at some of the differentiating factors in this series. I believe it is important to provide a biblical viewpoint based only on what we read in the Bible about the subject when we combine various aspects that have been hidden in the passages of the supernatural book. As usual, it is important to focus on the avoidance of contradictions between passages when we formulate our understanding. I hope this will bless you. If you haven't seen the previous videos in the series, you are welcome to do so, as they will provide you with background on what we discuss here today. So let's get started by looking at what Paul writes to the churches of Corinth and Thessalonica. These two passages are probably best known for describing the events surrounding what has become known as the Rapture. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What do these two passages mean, and where does this event that Paul describes fit into the timeline that we have covered in this series up to this point? There are many opinions among believers about what it is that Paul is conveying here, and even more opinions on when this event will occur. To get to the truth, however, we need to allow God's Word to interpret itself. Any question we may have about a specific passage in the Bible will also have an answer somewhere else in this amazing book that will somehow be linked to the passage in question. We just have to find it. I will provide some examples of these as we continue and I believe these will show you how focusing on these attributes of God's Word open up new understanding and insight into passages that have for ages led to arguments between members who are part of the same body of Christ. I believe that when we keep these aspects in mind when we study this subject that Paul refers to, it is possible to get a clear understanding of what he is saying, and to accurately position this event on the timeline associated with Daniel's 70th week. Our Heavenly Father has designed and constructed His Word in such a way that it requires us to consider various aspects, each providing us with a little bit of information and detail about the various subjects that we are considering. We have to piece these together in order to get the full picture. As I have stated before, there is one passage that clearly points out this characteristic of God's Word, and this is given in Isaiah 28. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. If we try to build our understanding of what God's Word says about a specific subject on just one or two passages, then we will inadvertently end up with opposing and conflicting interpretations of what is being conveyed in the Bible about a subject. 
as we would be missing the additional clarifying detail required to complete our insight into a matter. Another attribute we see in the Word of God is the use of patterns to convey information to us. Our Heavenly Father would provide a specific pattern in one or more situations that describe specific concepts to us that we can then apply to events or subjects that we are investigating that are clearly connected to this pattern. The Bible states that God is the same yesterday, today and tomorrow, and we know that when, we, when He provides us with a specific pattern in His Word, it is meant for us to understand specific situations in which we are required to refer to this provided pattern to obtain a complete understanding of something that seems confusing or contradictory. When it comes to prophecy, we are constantly dealing with patterns that repeat and we are required to recognize specific patterns provided in the Word of God in order to understand what our Heavenly Father is showing us. When we consider specific statements in the Word, they might seem strange or even contradictory in the absence of an applied pattern, but they often also teach us more about our Heavenly Father's character. One example of this that I would like to start with as an introduction today would be when Jesus told his disciples the following. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. This passage read in isolation has led to different interpretations and understandings of the believer's position in this world. Some believe that this passage indicates to us that those that have been redeemed by Jesus' work on the cross have to suffer the wrath of God during the tribulation, and that this is what those that find themselves living in this period can expect. They would often substantiate their viewpoint referring to this verse in support of this argument, and to confirm their position. However, we know that our Heavenly Father has provided us with more information in His Word to obtain a more thorough understanding of what is meant. When I read this verse, I immediately think of another passage that would seem to contradict what this verse in John's Gospel is saying. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Wherefore comfort yourselves together, and edify one another even as also ye do. So how do we put these passages together so that we avoid the seemingly contradicting statements and arrive at an understanding that does not have these two passages result in what seems to be a contradiction, but that they would in fact complement each other? Looking at the detail in 1 Thessalonians 5, we see Paul hinting at the spiritual armor and we know that this is clearly explained with more information provided to us in Ephesians 6, where we see the following written. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. When we evaluate these two passages, we see that Paul tells us to put on the spiritual armor to our disposal, to withstand the devil's onslaught, and that there is a battle going on in the spiritual realm. We see this confirmed in the following passage that ties both the previous passages together and gives us an understanding of what is going on. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, 
make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Peter clearly tells us that the affliction we experience in this world comes from the devil and not from God, and that the devil is in a battle with those who are alive in the world. The Bible clearly points out to us that the kingdoms of this world are currently under the control of Satan, based on the statue mentioned in Daniel 2 that is only destroyed when Jesus returns to the earth at the Mount of Olives to set up his everlasting kingdom. This is when the earth and the statue representing the kingdoms of the earth under Satan's control are hit by the stone that is cut without hands, splitting the Mount of Olives into two and destroying the statue that represents the kingdoms of this world. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and it became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. Peter also tells us that we have to resist Satan in faith and that we all suffer for a while before we are made perfect by our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Another very important aspect is that this passage refers to Satan by describing and comparing him to a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour and we know of an incident in the Word of God that provides a perfect pattern based on what we have just read to obtain a better understanding of what it is that both Jesus and Paul said. We find the following in Daniel 6. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel, and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace, and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning, and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel, and the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live for ever. My God hath sent his angel, and hath shut the lions' mouths, that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Everything we have read about in passages from the New Testament is provided in pattern form from the incident where Daniel found himself in the lion's den. Satan, who is described as a roaring lion, is the one with the potential to cause tribulation for Daniel, who is called a man greatly beloved by God, as seen in the following passage. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter, and consider the vision. The lions, however, had no power over Daniel. But why? Daniel tells us, in his explanation to Nebuchadnezzar, that in the eyes of the Lord he was innocent before God and before the king, and that he has done the right thing by putting God first in his life and Nebuchadnezzar's commandment second. Daniel had faith in his God to protect him from these lions, but it is interesting to see that it was Nebuchadnezzar who proclaimed his faith in Daniel's God to Daniel, stating at the start of this passage to Daniel that Daniel's God would be able to save him from this ordeal. We see then that Daniel in the lion's den is a perfect pattern provided by God to show us how the church is positioned in the world, which is under Satan's control. Daniel mentions his position before God as being innocent before him, describing to us the righteousness that our Heavenly Father imputes to us through the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross. 
When we think of Daniel, we should keep in mind that what is described in this passage occurred before Jesus came to restore our relationship with God in absolute perfection. When we compare this information to what we read in the New Testament, we find several connections to Daniel wearing the armor of God and preventing Satan from attacking him. Let us see how this compares to what we read in Ephesians 6. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Daniel was a man that was greatly beloved by our Heavenly Father, because he had an intimate relationship with him, and also had great faith in his God. And this is evidenced in Daniel's response to Nebuchadnezzar's request for his dream to be interpreted without knowing what Nebuchadnezzar dreamt. When Gabriel initiates conversations with Daniel, he, he always addresses Daniel as a man greatly beloved by God. Daniel also kept to the prescriptions of the law with regards to the food that they should eat, even when they were captives in another country. He put his relationship with his God above anything else and followed a pattern that was instructed to the church in Ephesians 6, so that we can understand our position before God and our authority over Satan through Jesus when we are wearing our spiritual armor. I believe then that Daniel in the lion's den is a perfect pattern provided to us in order to understand the position of the church on the earth, operating within the kingdoms of Satan. Daniel was able to stand against the lions that were incapacitated and they could do nothing to him, but Daniel did what was necessary to be protected. When we study this carefully, we see that Daniel was wearing the full spiritual armor described in Ephesians 6. Daniel was girded with the truth as he studied the scriptures and knew God's word and the truth, and he lived according to these requirements, even if it meant disobeying the king's orders. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that he was found innocent before God, and this is the breastplate of righteousness that he put on. He was ready to live out the truth of God's word before the world without compromise, which is the shoes of the gospel of peace. Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar both had faith in Daniel's God to protect him from the lions, and this is the shield with which the attacks of Satan are stopped. Daniel also had the helmet of salvation on as he was said to be a man greatly beloved by God, because of his uncompromising stance towards his God and for having great faith. Daniel studied the word of God daily and had the sword of God in his hand to launch a counterattack against the enemy, and we see Daniel's enemies being devoured by the lions as a result. Daniel's situation in the lion's den provides us with a perfect pattern of the church in the world when wearing all of the spiritual armor provided by God. We see more descriptive information about the church being described in the following passages. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, 
and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. When we recognize the position of the church, which according to God's word is even more privileged than that of Daniel before God, being loved by God as much as the Father loves his only begotten Son, having received the imputed perfected righteousness of the Son of God, and being the only entity in history to have received God's authority over Satan through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, I believe we begin to see why much of what is said in Hosea 4 verse 6 apply to many belonging to the church today. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. Many of those who have been redeemed by God, in my opinion, lack the knowledge of who they are in Christ and have not girded their loins with the truth. They also lack the faith required to wield a shield to Satan who is described as a lion seeking whom he may devour. He is more than happy to attack those found on the battlefield without the proper gear and these people are often not even aware of the fact that they are on a battlefield without their battle gear. When we apply the knowledge that we have obtained from Daniel's encounter with the lions to what is said in the New Testament, we obtain a better understanding of what Jesus meant in John 16 verse 33, when talking about the tribulation we experience in this world. This tribulation comes about exclusively as a result of Satan's battle with those who have been made in the image of God. God's stance in this situation is to protect those who are greatly beloved in his eyes and to keep them from the tribulation that Satan wants to bring over their lives. This is also a legal battle where we see Satan accusing the brethren before God day and night, looking for an opportunity to launch an attack against those who are not fully protected by God's armor. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. God has provided a set of rules through which Satan can obtain the legal right to afflict a person, when that person deviates from those rules or disregards some of the armor that God has provided for our protection. When we study the book of Job, we obtain another great example of how Satan gained the legal right to attack Job as a result of fear that he allowed in his life instead of having faith in God. This removed the shield of faith that Job could have wielded against the attack from Satan and left him unprotected when Satan attacked. Job had the following to say about his situation. For the thing which I greatly feared is come up on me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. Job's situation is linked to what is described in 1 John 4, and as a result of his fear, Satan had the legal right to bring torment into his life and cause severe tribulation in Job's life as a result of the shield of faith that was missing. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. In contrast to Daniel, we see that Job lacked faith or the shield that Daniel wielded in his situation. If Daniel feared the lions and what they could do to him, he would have lowered his shield and would have given Satan the opportunity to attack him through the lions. So often do I see people asking why we should expect those who belong to the Lord to escape 
the tribulation described in Revelation, given the persecution of so many Christians during the ages? This is a very valid question. However, when we study the Bible in a little more detail to understand the position of the church on the earth, we also begin to understand the difference between the tribulation caused by Satan, who is constantly seeking whom he may devour, and God's judgment of the world or the wrath of God described in the book of Revelation. Tribulation that people experience in their lives and the wrath of God are two distinctly different things. We find another pattern similar to what we have seen in Daniel's situation facing the tribulation caused by Satan that describes a pattern to us of God's wrath. With this pattern I believe we can better understand the period known as the Great Tribulation or God's judgment being executed over the world, and more specifically for whom this time is intended. This is also found in the book of Daniel and demonstrated to us in the episode of the Fiery Furnace that was heated to seven times its normal temperature in which we see Daniel's three friends being protected by God from any harm. This image gives us a pattern to better understand Israel's position during this period of time known as Jacob's trouble that is specifically meant for bringing God's chosen nation back into a relationship with their Messiah after rejecting him and part of his word 2000 years ago. We see this work of God with Israel described in the following passages where God addresses Israel in reference to the furnace depicted in Daniel. For my name's sake will I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. All they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace. They are even the dross of silver. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Because ye are become dross, behold, therefore I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem as they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin into the midst of the furnace to blow the fire upon it to melt it, so will I gather you in mine anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire of my wrath, and ye shall be melted in the midst thereof. As silver is melted in the midst of the furnace, so shall ye be melted in the midst thereof. And ye shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury upon you. These passages clearly connect Israel with Daniel's three friends that were thrown into a furnace for refusing to worship King Nebuchadnezzar. This scenario provides a pattern for Israel during the Great Tribulation that we can use to understand their situation, as well as that of the church. We know from Revelation 12 that the remnant of Israel will be under God's protection once they flee Jerusalem when the Antichrist murders the two witnesses and sets up the abomination of desolation in the rebuilt temple. We also know that this will bring about the great destruction that will occur when Jesus returns to do away with Satan's reign over the kingdoms of the earth and to set up his own everlasting kingdom. Isaiah 30 tells us that the sun's light during this time will be increased sevenfold, and the same for the moon, resulting in the temperature on the earth increasing sevenfold, and drawing another clear connection to the furnace described in Daniel. The furnace was heated seven times more than what was normal. When we combine this information with many of the prophecies and what we read in the book of Revelation, we, we know that God's judgment is poured out over the earth when the tribulation starts, and that there are 21 events described to us that provide us with more detail about these judgments. These are not necessarily 21 separate events, but 21 descriptions to provide us with information on the events taking place during this period. We see that God saves a remnant of Israel through this time and that they are the only mortal flesh that will remain until the new earth is created at the end of the tribulation. When we turn this around it is even more revealing to us when we find that Daniel 
who would have had the same response as his three friends to the king's command, is nowhere to be found when his three friends are thrown into the furnace. This is a very important piece of the pattern that we have to keep in mind when we consider Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians 5, stating that those who are children of light, having the armor of God, have not been appointed to God's wrath, portrayed as a furnace that is meant for bringing Israel back into a, a relationship with their Messiah. This understanding is then also accurately portrayed in the pattern of Daniel 6, where Daniel, who was greatly beloved by God, is completely absent from the furnace episode. This gives us the first piece of the puzzle showing us that a pattern exists in which our Heavenly Father removes those who are greatly beloved by Him from having to be present on earth at the time when this judgment starts. So why would the church, or at least part of the church, be allowed to escape the period known as the Great Tribulation? When we study the church, we see that Jesus announces the creation of His church to Peter in Matthew 16 verse 18 we read the following. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. From what we read, Jesus personally gave the authority of the heavenly kingdom to his church on earth, having the keys of the kingdom of heaven and given authority over Satan and his kingdom. This, once again, matches the pattern presented to us through Daniel's situation in the lion's den. When we search the scriptures, it is amazing to find that the church is the only entity in all of God's word that, that receives this kind of authority over Satan that is elaborated on in much detail when we study Paul's epistles about the believer's position in Christ. When we understand the truth about the authority of those that have been redeemed by Jesus over Satan and his kingdom, we begin to understand what Paul is describing in 2 Thessalonians 2 when he discusses the coming of the Antichrist and that his coming requires a restrainer to be removed. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Who or what is the restrainer that Paul talks about? When we approach this topic, we have to make use of an elimination process to arrive at the answer. The first question to answer would be, who would be in a position to resist the Antichrist? The most likely candidates, in my opinion, would be God, angels, or the Church of God. We know that God is all-powerful and has created both Satan and the Antichrist and will definitely have power over him and would be able to resist him. Paul's explanation above of the action that will be carried out to allow the Antichrist to be revealed seems to be performed by a, a higher power that removes the entity that is withholding and the way in which this is worded does not fit an action that would describe God's direct restraining of the Antichrist in my opinion. God would not be taken out of the way because there is no one capable of doing that. If it was God's intention to have Paul write this with God as the restraining entity in mind, who would then take God out of the way? One would think that if this was what Paul was conveying to his audience, that he would phrase the sentence differently. Next we look at angels. Many believe that this resisting power is the archangel Michael, but we do not read in God's word that any of God, God's angels have been given the task or authority to resist the devil here on earth or to prevent him from making known the identity of the Antichrist. In fact, we read in Daniel quite the opposite. The earth is Satan's current dominion and God's angels have to fight their way through those of Satan's to get things done as can be seen in the following passages. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Then said he, 
Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. So from these passages it would seem that in the time of Daniel at least, angels, good or bad, operated on an equal footing here on earth, but that fallen angels can effectively resist God's angels. We also see a battle described between Satan and his angels, and Michael and his angels in Revelation 12, and that this has a, as a result Satan's confinement to earth. This would also not seem to perfectly fit with the situation that Paul is referring to in 2 Thessalonians 2, as this war occurs in heaven. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. We, we even have scriptures where humans are said to have power over angels, where Jacob is described in wrestling with the angel of the Lord, where those who belong to Christ will be appointed judges over angels, and finally, where Hebrews describe the position of angels. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? We could then categorize the angel option as questionable at most, as we do not have any passages assigning authority to angels over other angels in God's word. Next, we will look at the final option and see if this is a more suitable candidate to fit Paul's description, the church. The very first mention of the church is made in Matthew 16. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What is noticeable here is that the very first attribute that is assigned to the church is the authority over hell, and that hell as the defending entity will not be able to withstand. Why is this? We find several passages expounding on this for us. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. 
And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We see overwhelming evidence of authority over Satan and hell given to the church or those who have been redeemed by our Savior, Savior Jesus Christ and who have received his indwelling Holy Spirit. The church is an entity that God established with a specific purpose in mind, having his authority over the world and over Satan and his dominion. It was a hidden secret that was not known to other ages, and whose attributes did not apply to past ages, neither will it apply to the Great Tribulation. Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Given this knowledge, we can now better understand what Paul is saying when we consider the church's authority on earth, and that is this. While the church is on earth, Satan and all of his angels are subject to the authority of God through his church. If Satan revealed his antichrist while the church is present on earth, and here we have to classify the church as those who have the indwelling Holy Spirit and who have an intimate relationship with their Heavenly Father, Satan would stand no chance of achieving his desired outcome. With the keys of the kingdom of heaven in the hands of the church, Satan will certainly face locked doors that he would need to be unlocked before he can take up the position as supreme ruler of the world through the Antichrist. We have seen the true church of God being victorious over Satan for more than 2,000 years now. It was God's purpose to put the church on earth to keep Satan under control and to prevent him from achieving his desired outcome before the time was right for it. This period of 2,000 years also allows time for God's harvest of souls to ripen, who will be included as part of his bride, when he sends his angels to harvest the field. When God then removes the church, locked doors will be unlocked for Satan, who will then not only be the head of authority on earth, but will also be confined to the earth and no longer have access to heaven to accuse those who are made in the image of God. I believe that those who are left with him on earth will no longer have the authority over Satan and his kingdom that the church had. We can then clearly see from the considerations above that the church being indwelled by God's spirit and having God's authority is the only valid withholding power that can be removed from earth to match the pattern given to us in Daniel 6 as well as the description that Paul gave to the churches of Corinth and Thessalonica and this removal of the church is necessary and required, in my opinion, in order for Satan to obtain supreme ruling status on earth that can then allow his antichrist to step forward without the threat of being defeated. Something else which would further cause a contradiction with the promises of Jesus in Matthew 16 if the church remained on earth during the tribulation is Revelation 13 verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. If God gave authority to the church over hell, and said that hell would not be able to withstand the church, why would God break his promise by allowing the Antichrist to overcome the church during the tribulation, as it seems to imply from this passage? God cannot lie, and he does not break his promises, so we know that when we read the verse above, that the saints cannot include those who have received authority over Satan, and this would contradict what Jesus said in Matthew 16 verse 18. 
It is also interesting that the word that is used for church or ecclesia is used abundantly in the first three chapters of Revelation. Then it is strangely absent from the text during the seal, trumpet and bowl judgments, just as Daniel is strangely absent from the ordeal in the fiery furnace. The word ecclesia is only used again at the second coming of Christ. This is by design, because God will not pour his wrath out over an entity that he considers his greatly beloved, and the pattern provided to us in the book of Daniel confirms this. We will study this in more detail in the next video, but to summarize our study of the rapture up to this point, we understand that God's wrath is different to the affliction that Satan causes in the lives of people. God is not the one that afflicts people, but Satan is, and he is looking for every opportunity to do so against those who are not equipped with the full armor of God. God has loved Daniel and used him as an example to show us a glimpse of the church's position in his eyes. God has provided us with battle gear to defeat Satan on earth if we keep to the instructions. God gave authority to the church over Satan and his kingdom which can only be obtained when we put on the complete battle gear provided. The church is the only entity found in the word of God that has received authority and a restraining power over Satan that is also required to be removed in order to allow Satan to be successful. Israel is a different entity when compared to the church and God has a different purpose with Israel of which the church is not part. The Great Tribulation is specifically meant to purify Israel and to bring them back into a relationship with their Messiah that they as a nation have rejected 2000 years ago. In the next video I will continue the study and provide you with more evidence explaining the rapture from a biblical perspective, avoiding contradiction between passages and studying the detail provided to us that will clearly paint a picture of what I believe the Bible is telling us. I hope that the information up to this point was insightful and encouraging. Thank you for watching the ninth installment in this series of God's Roadmap to the End. If you are interested in more information about this and if you do not want to wait until the next video is made available, please download a free copy of God's Roadmap to the End ebook which is linked in the section below. You will find a lot more detail in it that we will discuss in future videos, specifically concerning the Rapture. I believe it will unlock many mysteries contained in God's Word for you. You're also welcome to download another ebook that I have authored with the title Factual Faith, Belief Founded on Truth. In this ebook I show how it is possible for a Christian to have 100% faith in the Word of God as being the truth. If this video is playing in a YouTube channel other than God's Roadmap to the End, please search on YouTube for the name shown in the banner below. All the links that are referred to in this video will be found there. Please share this information with as many people as possible. It may be controversial, but I believe time will prove that God's word is true and reliable. If you enjoy this video, give us a like and subscribe, as there will be more coming in the weeks and months before us. If you have any specific questions or comments, you are welcome to post them in the comment section below, or to send me a message if you would like to discuss something in particular. You will also find links to the other videos in the series in the description below. Until next time, God bless.